Yeah, welcome back. So you're being recorded now. Um, Tracy Shitar, so thanks for joining. Do you have any specific questions that you want to discuss? Um, I just wanted you to go over average causal mediation effect and average yeah. direct effect. Okay, that's class number 12. Yeah. So is the, is, the, is the difference clear in principle of what a direct effect constitutes and what uh, um, ACME constitutes? So you essentially, you look at two different pathways where you essentially uh, are looking at, hi Daryl, thanks for joining. Where you essentially have, where you have, uh, a direct effect uh, of your uh, treatment on your outcome variable, whereas a mediated effect is essentially um, a part of this uh, effect, of the total effect. So the average, the average causal mediated mediation effect is essentially the effect where you keep your treatment equal and the difference is here definitely uh, the presence or none or the zero or one on your mediator. So essentially by that, you can basically uh, carve out your essential overall uh, effect that is uh, conferred to by your mediator. Whereas the treatment is basically set equal and therefore uh, all this effect that you see is here attributed to your mediator. Uh, compared to a directed effect, where basically your mediator is set to uh, to one condition, so it's either one or zero, and the difference here is really the treatment effect, so that is either uh, the treatment per se, which is either one or zero, and therefore you can uh, carve out uh, to what extent the treatment alone with the mediator being set to equal is attributed to the treatment effect only. So this is essentially how uh, R will basically do the work for you with the mediation package to actually carve ADE and ACME out. So it's actually, there's a type, but it's actually ACME. I have to change this. So is, is this what you're essentially asking? Or what in more specific terms are you interested in, Shita? Um, no, I was just looking for a general overview of those um, two um, terms. So yeah, no, that's that's good, Professor. Now, what essentially you really want to map out, what is this axis, what uh, goes uh, in, in this full effect, in this total effect, uh, what is attributed to this direct uh, line, whereas what is being conferred to by the mediator. And this is essentially what the mediation package nicely uh, carves out for you. And this is what the output essentially means um, here. So here you have basically, you have the ACME attributed in the control group and in the treated group. So this is where uh, control and treated was set equal and just mediator one or mediator was set to either one or zero. And therefore it allows you to really give, uh, give you an estimate of what effect is attributed to the axis via the mediator in both of these groups. So it's individual, uh, it's individual estimates for uh, mediating effect. Equally, you have here for uh, ADE for control and treated, you get this direct effect in both groups, carving out that uh, mediator. And overall, taking into account both uh, axes, you will get the total effect. And here essentially was the proportions. The proportions basically give you a proportion of each of these uh, axes. And basically allows you to distinguish what is, uh, how much of this is actually an, an, an immediated effect and what is essentially a direct effect. And that's actually the beauty of it, because by that you really can see that there is a consistent treatment effect that you see irrespective of the groups. So when you compare here the treatment effect that is somewhat comparable, right? 
comparing this with the 95% confidence intervals gives you kind of a consistent effect between um, directly between exposure and outcome or treatment and outcome, irrespective of the mediator, of the presence of a mediator. And that's what this uh, package essentially allows you to do. And yeah, does this essentially uh, help you to increase your understanding or what, what's, what specifically were you looking at? Yes, yes that Did you do? helps, thank you. Sure, and, and did you do the lab? Did you all have a chance to uh, look at the lab already? Um, for lab 12? Yes. I did it. Um, I actually have a question of it. I don't know if you mm -hmm. already went through it yesterday, but I know uh, one of the labs at the end, you want us to comment on the difference when we, um, sorry, let me pull it up. But essentially, I guess I just wanted to ask when you were asking for our comments when we did, when we ran through the models with pedal and without pedal, that variable, mm -hmm. what, what were we supposed to focus on? Because I noticed there was a change for me, but I also didn't know if my coding caused, you know, an error for a change. Well, it is essentially the difference by including a confounder in, in uh, the analysis. And, and the beauty of that is that essentially uh, that mediating effect is basically uh, mediating um, the, the length as well as the, uh, the, what was it, the width. And basically the direct effect remained consistent, independent of adjusting for the confounding effects that we had. So that, that observation that you had, it was slightly different, but it wasn't entirely different. And the direct effect actually remained comparable between both models with confounder and without confounder. So that was what I was shooting for there. Does that make it clearer? Yeah, sorry, I'm just pulling up my lab to see something. Mm -hmm. So essentially the idea was to have here the attractiveness to B, right? And this is basically, this is spread up in two different parts. And Did you find it? Oh, sorry, yes, I did. Um, so I noticed for me, um, mm -hmm. my second result ended up having a higher prop mediator mediated value. Mm -hmm. Um, and the ADE was negative, it was a negative value, which, um, I wasn't sure if maybe I did something wrong because I wasn't sure if that change should have happened so drastically compared to the mm -hmm. original model. Um, I, I'm not sure why it was negative. I don't think it should have been negative. Well, let's look, let's look through it again. Mm. Okay. So we're basically, we're loading here the package. Let's close all of this. You basically, you're building here your first, uh, random variety, right? Then you build here the second random arrival with the pedal width. Now you create the mediator, including random one and random two in the early codes um, that are being asked for. With the third variable, you get here this random noise in addition to that. So these are non plant specific attributes uh, as outlined here by Marcel and you know. And then based on that, you build your dependent variable. So you're simulating this through essentially. So you have here a total effect that you're mapping out here with this, uh, with this model. Where basically you have a uh, separate length um, at 0 0.11. When you look now at the mediator, you're getting here to a 0 0.22. 
So this is the association between the zipper length as the exposure and the mediator. So if you're now including the fit dependent variable, or was this the negative that you meant in the model? Or did you mean the proportion, the direct effect? No, that wasn't the one I was referencing to. Mine okay. came later on. Yeah. Okay. So if we're bootstrapping now, this mediation analysis. So what we see here that the mediator actually trumps the zipper length. So maybe this is what is negative. Uh, slips into the assessment. I don't recall it as negative. Okay, so now we have the results one. The results one here. Basically, did you mean this effect, which is consistent with this? But it's a non-significant effect, right? So basically, it indicates that it's uh, different that the mediator has stronger weight, and this is this uh, random noise that takes away from the zipper length. So when we're going now in the next step, uh, so we have been now up here with the out zipper length. That was the mediator. Now we're fitting the linear. We have the results. Now we're going towards a fit of the total effect with the pedal width included. So now we see here that both uh, are not independently significantly associated. But if we're looking now at the mediator per se, we're seeing now that zipper length is now significantly associated. If uh, we are now in the next step looking at the association, this again goes away, which means that the mediator, which could be again this uh, non plant specific attractiveness, is again uh, a stronger effect. And now in results two, once we do the bootstrapping again, we can see whether the direct effect is now essentially uh, reserved and in the same magnitude, independent of the mediators. If we do now results one and results two, we compare them, we see now that the direct effect is here essentially, yes, it's negative, but it's kind of comparable and it's a non significant effect. So both uh, models basically indicate that there's no effect, but it's comparable between both models, independent of the the adjustment for the confounding uh, of for the confounder and also for the mediator. So basically, uh, the stratification of the mediator and confounding factors and whatever is on the pathway associated with the mediator is essentially uh, a separate part, which essentially is here comparable in terms of uh, in, uh, in 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 terms of the proportions, comparable to some extent, but essentially the direct effect of uh, separate lengths as a predictor remains preserved. And this kind of, yes, it's negative, but it's, it's non-significant, which means there's no direct effect. Does that explain your question? But it is negative, you're right, yes. Yeah, I think something happened in my earlier codes because some of my values are off from the ones I see on yours. So I have to go back to see what happened. Oh, yeah. Well, it's also it's 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 notably it's it's uh, it's a simulation, right? But you had the same set seed, right? So it should have been the same simulation in a way. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go back to my code and see what changed because my values are different from yours. Okay, that's surprising. Okay, any other questions uh, concerning this aspect? But essentially, it's it's an elegant way to essentially get to the direct effect. And the mediation package really allows you to uh, carve out what proportion of the total effect is uh, mediated and what is a direct effect. 
of your exposure variable. And that's basically the uh, important thing to keep in mind. Good. Any other questions to class 12? If not, then we can move on to class 13. And um, uh, I, I also highly recommend that you uh, do review uh, the link. this outline by Matthias Fox, who is really a good outline of what the simulation constitutes. And so maybe things are here explained as I explained them. Um, okay. So the 13th class was essential on missing data. And that's um, as outlined in the lecture, that's unfortunately something that you will come across quite often when you, when you analyze data. So um, the, the biggest problem you actually will be coming across is that you never can be certain whether data is really missing completely at random or not. And this is also what, um, so this is with the chain data set. This is nicely uh, lined out. But a real interesting take home message is uh, this, yeah, this classification by Little and Rubin. So in a perfect world, you would really have this uh, missing data missing completely at random. And this is unfortunately not in many cases, not the case. So there's usually there's a reason that this data is missing. And if you can't be 100% certain, um, you, you do to some extent uh, run into some problems because in a worst case scenario, this really can create uh, substantial biases in your analysis. So it's always uh, quite uh, important to keep in mind to understand what data is missing and why could it be missing. And with multiple amputation, you actually you have an interesting tool uh, to preserve your sample size in your analysis to basically replace these missing values and to deal with these missing values in a quite sophisticated way. And it also it allows you to confirm whatever you see in the model. And I think this is a good take home message and Professor Sang is referring to it in one of the later slides. You basically, you can distinguish between what is actually caused by sampling so is it the selection bias that you're seeing or what is caused by uh, the model per se? And are you actually looking at the right model? And multiple amputation really allows you in three different steps to essentially uh, compare your, your, different, um, your different insights. And by doing that, uh, essentially, uh, you can also ascertain that the model that you're employing is actually really giving you the answer that you want to see. And comparing them, the, the key is here really that you compare the estimates that you get from your model. So, and this is nicely lined out here in the lab where we essentially um, work with the chain data set. And we're basically loading this into our environment. Mm -hmm. That has disappeared. So, sorry. Sure, I have to try it in there. So, you can essentially see already when you inspect the data set that there are many missing values. And you basically, the lecture outlines which variables are being used. Uh, of note, uh, damage is not to be included. So damage would be an alternative outcome. So the virus and the damage essentially will be acting quite collinear because of a, a higher, higher virus load will essentially cause greater damage, greater end organ damage. And when building the first models, this is just a univariate model. As we know, we're busy with taking uh, the log virus variable and we are analyzing it as a function of the treatment. And if you look at this function, 
and this model, we essentially see that uh, treatment, the treatment was zero, so no treatment, essentially as the reference value uh, having an not too adherent treatment uh, will already lower the, uh, the viral load and adherent treatment will uh, lower the viral load even stronger. So this is a model where both of these variables actually um, show and confer a significant advantage of uh, adhering to your retroviral uh, regimen. When you include additional variables, age, income, health, uh, or mental status, mental health, you essentially you get uh, a comparable model and a comparable picture. So you essentially see uh, a comparable kind of uh, increase, which is here, and, and this is um, kind of the interesting aspect. So there is some confounding going on that uh, treatment two, where you're fully adherent to your, um, does actually kind of seem to decrease to some extent. And that could be by, caused by various factors. So it, it wouldn't be uh, expected based on, um, not medical terms, right? So if you compare now all of these models uh, next to each other, you can see this actually in one aspect. And Tracy, I believe you had some questions about the stargazer package, right? I did, yeah. Mm. Is, is this a, a context in which you want to talk about this? Or do you want to reserve some time after? Um, yeah, I do have other questions. If you have time after, I would like to talk with you about. But regarding Stargazer, um, I just noticed that it, the examples of the research notes you have shared with us, their table were very clean and pristine. And mm -hmm. when I use Stargazer, like I don't know how to like code it in a way where it produces, you know, the table in a cleaner way. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to see if you could provide some more guidance with the coding. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm to be honest, I'm not the biggest expert on stargazers. So I hope I can answer your question. That seemed to be quite, um, quite advanced. Um, we can definitely look at this, but you can also, uh, so these models can also be, um, so stargazer is just one of the examples uh, of these, um, how should I say these summarization packages? So there are different ones. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure now which table you're referring to and which package uh, students may have used. So there are also ways how you can essentially depict this in a different way. It's also stargaze is not the only way uh, of, of, of how to look at this data. You can also create these tables essentially um, manually. And so I, for example, I do not use in my daily, my daily uh, routine, in my daily job, when I code something, I would not use the Stargazer package, to be honest, because I want more uh, flexibility on what I depict. But I think you can uh, easily go, and just, let's just uh, have something on the side. So we have now these two models. We can now, for example, just go, let's create an additional script. We can now easily just show these two models, uh, type equals text, that's really key. Also with the, the normal way of uh, employing this. So you definitely, is this more the format that you have seen? Um. No, but I can show you what I was talking about. If you were like, like for sometimes for the, you know, the left column where they write out the variables, uh, maybe it's the way I code it, but the way they write it out, um, like when I factor race and ethnicity, it will write factor race, ethnicity, one non-Hispanic white, like it'll write it all out without a spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of looked crowded. Um, that's like one example where I had some difficulties with surveys. Okay. Uh, I also, I found, uh, so I was uh, expecting you today, so I did look up for some um, additional um, outlines of how to use Stargaze, and there's actually a good one from Northeastern, a good overview on how to use that, in addition to the package manual, obviously, um, that also will be quite useful in that regard. 
but I think you can uh, easily, oops, <laughs> that's maybe not it. Um, uh, so you can basically uh, individualize all of these outputs. So you can, uh, so if you are interested in customizing the outputs on uh, your labors, you can basically create here with covariate labors. So on the column labors, you, uh, you will be able to customize these entries. On covariate labels, you can uh, you can basically customize how you want those covariates to be labeled. So you can with covariates labels, you should be able to covariates labels equal C should be um, let's go through that treatment treatment equals one. And do this, you should be able to kind of customize it here. I said I'm not a big expert on Stargazer, but it's an, an useful exercise to be done. Do uh, H and we do income, and we do health status. It should be a very versatile package allowing for you to essentially and let's call this intercept rather than constant. I think this should now. Yeah. So with covariates labor, you can basically customize this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So covariates labor, and uh, let me also drop this in the chat. Wait, uh, where's my chrome now? Is it clear to me? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me also drop this in the chat. And what is it this? Can you access the chat? Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So these are two uh, quite useful references. So as you can see, uh, and I always I encourage you whenever you have functions or you have packages that you're not 100% familiar with, uh, always go through the package manuals. They're, in most cases, they're quite easy to, uh, to get a handle on things. So essentially, you can here really uh, change and individualize uh, a lot of things. You can change fonts and digits and you can, you can um, state how many digits you want and they also will give you um, give you uh, all these options these options possibilities for example um, so you can replace the standard errors here with confidence intervals so if you do ci that should be ci equals true I'm just confirm that quickly yeah ci equals true here we go CI equals true should be a default of 0 0.95, I would assume. Let's rely on that for now. Uh, what's important is that you organize your text. So always I recommend to always kind of bring longer text always on the next, uh, on the next line. And CI equals true. That should get us now confidence intervals rather than standard errors. So in principle, I'd always recommend to use confidence intervals over standard errors because confidence intervals at the same time you do, obviously you have the p-values given, so you know the p-values, you know this is significant, but it's always nice to always get this additional insight into the variability of an estimate. It's quite, quite important to see that uh, at times. And the variability of a 95% confidence at the words also automatically includes hypothesis testing because in, if, if, if you do, um, no, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to, 95% confidence at the word will always be right, but you could hypothetically, you could also alter it. 
What's also interesting, and I just want to emphasize this. So we have now loaded the chain data set. So if you do, oh, we still have the DF. If you do stargazer, and you just give it uh, a data set and you say uh, iris and you write type equals text it also gives you a type one table like uh, presentation for all continuous variables that's also a very useful um, also a very useful function so you have here automatically uh, the sample size given which is also nice to have um, and you get means and it also should give you here only the complete uh, cases that will basically remove the NAs. So that's that's also a neat function to have. Okay, hope this helps uh, with the Stargazer package. It's a little challenging at, at, at times, I know. Um, so you can here, for example, you can uh, here you can omit the stats, so you can omit the R squared, you know, the standard errors, the statistics, and the adjusted, which uh, is for the presentation of uh, here, maybe kind of beneficial, but you can also, hypothetically, you can also remove that. And if you rerun this chunk, you will basically get now uh, an overview with these variables of the model accuracy. So you get here an adjusted R square. So with the omit function, uh, you're basically omitting this additional um, statistics. So I hope that helps a bit with Stargazer. It's it's quite a popular uh, popular way of, of using this data and then play around with it. It can be helpful. It definitely will be helpful for bias too, um, by the way, in this topic. So what's also nice is this MD pattern. Any other questions on Stargazer? Or was that enough information for now? It's really, it's it, uh, R is uh, quite a bit of trial and error. You basically, if, if, if you just play around those functions, usually you can't do much damage, particularly with, uh, with uh, functions like Stargazer because it's just a display uh, version. So playing around with the different options, I always encourage you to also use uh, the question mark. So you see this below here with question mark and the functions you always, you get very uh, function specific explanations. And you basically get not only the package manual, but you also get here uh, quite specific uh, instructions on how to use the various different options in your function. Can be very, uh, can be very useful. You can also, you can add captions, you can, uh, at, uh, so you can really do a lot of things. You can uh, also, you can replace default confidence and voice for each models. You can play around quite a bit with it. Yeah, I never got too deep into uh, individualization of the columns set width. So this is maybe also important. So you can also automatically export this into LaTeX code which is uh, maybe for those of you who are more technically inclined and want to um, play around more with exporting tables into a PDF format, quite helpful. And basically it, it will allow it to uh, transform it into LaTeX, which essentially is um, PDF coding. So, so, but back to our missing data pattern. So what is really nice here to see is that you get here, um, a clear overview of complete cases and missing values. And by that you essentially you get an overview of how many missing values you have for each of your variable. And these patterns make it quite uh, easy to get a good overview. So this is definitely a quite important uh, command, particularly for larger data sets and kind of will give you a taste on what variables could be missing and for what reason could they be missing. Could they be missing. Um, you can now with uh, this command, you basically are then doing nothing else but um, recoding your mental damage and treatment variables into factors, which makes it easy then for the rest of the 
uh, investigation. So you basically, yeah, so this just displays the entire data frame. You can now with uh, names, well, we know the names function basically gives you an overview of the uh, names uh, of included variables. You can now with uh, the mice function, and this is now interesting because now we're getting into the multiple implementation. So you're basically, you're using the data frame chain, you create 50 replica of your data sets and you're basically, you're imputing them using different, uh, ways of, uh, of imputing them. Oh. You can look at the specific different methods. So we basically have here So we basically, we have here different uh, methods. So essentially you do with the PMM, you do a predictive mean matching. This is basically for numeric data, uh, kind of the standard. So when you go through the list of uh, variables in here, so you do basically, you do the predictive mean matching for log virus, age, income, and healthy. You do a logistic regression method where you basically, you uh, calculate the, uh, the, the, the odds for each event to be uh, for, for, for an, uh, not an event, but for one criterion for your missing data. You're basically replacing those missing data with um, what is the result of your logistic regression employed. You have here a poly, uh, polytonous uh, regression imputation with poly rack. So this is basically um, uh, mental health damage. So damage is this variable from one to five. So you basically have a polytomous logistic regression and the same for treatment because treatment also has three factors, right? Whereas mental, for example, is only a zero to one, a uh, zero or one. So you can use a, a normal logistic regression. So this being said, with the mice functions, you're basically building these 50 different multiple imputed data sets, which will take now a little bit to compute. Well, actually, no, I don't have it anymore. So once we have that, we can investigate this and you can, and this is also to be kept in mind, whenever you get the data mice, Always keep in mind that R creates with every function that you run, it will create an object. And this object, you can always extract all information that is available within an object from this, um, from this object. And I will just show you in a second how to do that for this particular uh, object. It's a little bit more challenging because uh, usually for the data frames, you would only do it, uh, yeah, no, I can do anything. You can um, basically access every, in, in a regression model, for example, if this is being packed into an object, you can address this just easily with the LS function, which basically gives you a list of sub objects contained within that object. So if you have here a model, uh, a model fit, like fit total effect on um, another results was a mediation object. But if you have a fit, um, a regression fit, you can with LS, you basically get a list of all the sub objects that are contained within that object. If um, you go LS summary fit, you get basically uh, an overview of the sub objects that are contained in that summary object. So everything becomes an object. As soon as you can call it and you can create something with it, it becomes an object. And all these sub objects are part, integral part of this object. It takes a little longer. And with the mice object, things are getting a little tricky because it's basically, it's uh, 50 multiple imputed uh, data sets that are then being used for the model fitting. This takes a little longer. Uh, 
but uh, definitely keep in mind that you can always get all information extracted automatically. So moving forward, if you, for example, you want to create uh, one of these regression model tables manually, you can extract this information and you can place it. If you create your own table, you can replace uh, or place any information from your model objects directly into this table, which is, which is in some situations quite nice. So I, for example, I do not really often use um, packages that automatically compute something like the table one package that I uh, mentioned yesterday. And uh, Daryl and Shitar may remember or the Stargazer package to create this table one. So there are different ways to uh, actually approach this. Okay, well, this is still loading. I can show you actually this table one package that I mentioned yesterday. Yeah, table one package in R. So that's a very nice package essentially that allows you to create, um, let's And then and this allows you really to create these um, uh, table one. And then when I refer to table one, this is to some extent in every scientific paper, you will see table one being the leading table that basically gives you an overview of your uh, data set. And that essentially allows you to do that with one click essentially. So you basically tell uh, our essentially how you want to look at this data and just equally like the Stargazer package, you can also customize a lot of things here with the table one function of the table one package. And you basically get here a nice overview, neatly organized. And with all these different, you can customize all the labels that you want to do. Uh, you can then with, uh, you can here group things differently. You can group things in Strata. You can uh, do various other things. Essentially, you can customize the statistics. You can um, change the labels. You can change the captions. So it's really a lot of things that you can do in this package. Um, so, Professor, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you. I yeah. see a black part of your screen where the R Studio used to be. Am I supposed to be seeing something there? Um, yeah, it's loading right now. Um, it's okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. Do you see it? Do you, do you see it now? Oh, um, I just see it black. I don't know if, I, if anybody else can see other stuff. I see black as well, too. Okay, yeah, so that's... do I. Okay. Well, it's still loading on my end. Uh, sorry for that. It could be uh, something that R is doing while it's loading. Um, let's give it another minute, maybe. <laughs> Sorry for that hiccup. I should have not removed all the objects, then I would have had it still in my uh, in my environment. Professor, will we be going over homework two on Monday? Yes, we can do that. On um, uh, the deadline for homework two is on Monday, right? So this is we can definitely do this on Monday. Yeah, I think that would be seven eighteen. The homework two is due on seven eighteen. You, homework two is only due on seven eighteen. Um, so that's a little problematic. Uh, are there specific questions to homework two, or to the topics that are discussed in homework two? Um, I didn't get to look over all of it. I think I looked over uh -huh. about half of it. Um, but yeah, no. Um, so if you if, if, if you maybe put together a list of questions for homework too, we can discuss it on Monday. So we can now go back to Monday and Wednesday at seven, if this is amenable for everybody. Uh, and then let's meet next week uh, on Monday and Wednesday, if that works. Are you okay. going to have the answer key on Monday or will that be after? Mm, uh, well, I can't really post the answer key before it's before the deadline, right? So this okay. is uh, 718. At, well, well, I would need to change the due date. Um, I can 
we can discuss it on Wednesday. So I will post the answer key once the due date has passed. And that's when submission will end. Um, so come on. Uh, but yes, I can I, I can post it right after after the due date. Uh, we can we can talk then on on Wednesday. Uh, but that you could also do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday if if if, uh, if you want. Um, but we can discuss it before uh, the class concludes. So how are things with research note two? Uh, are things progressing well on all uh, all your ends? Get this text for I'm sorry for that. Are things going well with research note two? I haven't even started researching one note two yet. Oh, okay. Okay, I just, started it, but I haven't really gone far with it. Okay, understood. Just make okay. sure I really have to. Uh, I really have to close uh, close submission uh, on Friday. Um, so that's that's. It puts me a little bit on a time crunch to get all the grading done and get some useful comments. So I'm gonna check the exact date when I have the grades submitted, and probably have to take my heels in really hard. Get all of this done on time. So this really takes very long. I apologize for this delay. Yeah, so we definitely we can discuss homework too in a due course of time. Um, I can actually uh, I can record a video uh, outlining all the questions in homework too and, and post this at the same time with the answer key to give some explanations that you have this earlier. Um, Make sure that there are no no open questions when uh, completing the research note. So I'll I'll record something over the weekend so that it comes out at the same time. So also, if you have specific question on homework too, please uh, definitely utilize the discussion board and, um, and, and, and I'd be happy to also respond to your questions there. Okay, and sorry again that this takes so long. Uh, okay, so we talked about table one. We talked about um, stargazer a bit. Um, hopefully now this is all kind of easier to handle. Um, look at this literally takes forever. I had this earlier running while I was doing something else. <laughs> I didn't even notice how long this was. Yeah, so you you, you got to think of this multiple imputation that it basically it does multiple imputation over fifty data sets. So when you look, uh, so we are right now at this step. So we are essentially right now, we're going through this aspect. So we're basically we're creating now uh, 50 imputed data sets. We use different prediction models to essentially build and build our data sets. So this 50 imputed, this 50 data sets that basically contain the imputed data. And basically it does then uh, pool all these data sets together and Build uh, one overarching result, and comparing this result essentially allows you then to distinguish whether there's a sampling problem or there's a problem with the method itself, and that's quite a useful uh, tool for this purpose. And I wish I could show you right now, but essentially the result will look like. Um, will look uh, in the same way as um, this is what we see here. So we're basically we're getting now estimates that are essentially to be compared with the initial estimate. And you see that there are differences that are basically not too grand. 
And the fact that these are basically smaller uh, differences indicate that there's not a real sampling problem, that actually the model does very well depict the data at hand and that the missing data was more likely to be uh, to some extent uh, missing at random. So not, uh, not um, biased in some shape or form. So that the insights that you gain from the data set are essentially consistent with what you would expect in real life. And this is still running, so we can't. And this is really what multiple imputation allows you to do. So it's always, uh, it's, it's quite a good idea. So I personally, I don't use multiple imputation much in my work for the reason that uh, I work a lot with very large data sets, which to some extent uh, allows you to, to kind of not have having to deal too much with missing data. There's always missing data and subset analysis and the consistency of results with subset analysis to some extent uh, takes concerns uh, out, of, out of missing data. And larger chunks of missing data are usually something that we would pretty much, if the research question allows, uh, remove. And we would really mainly work with complete cases, which is one way to deal with missing data. So if you remove all your missing data and those entries where you have missing data, that is not always causing a bias, but basically the main concern with it is that it reduces your sample size often quite dramatically. And if you have very large data sets, this is less of a concern. If you do then subset analysis on this data set, then it becomes more of a concern because in some certain subsets, this uh, missing data may be missing for a reason. So as a, as a good example in my world, for example, is uh, subset analysis on some certain comorbidities. So dialysis patients are to a, to, a, to a large extent that are diabetic patients and many of them suffer from cardiovascular disease. So many of them have, for example, congestive heart failure which is a huge issue in dialysis patients. And so the number of patients with documented congestive heart failure, for example, is considerably low. And if you create them from, from this huge subsets that we have at this position, you create them a subset uh, based on a comorbidity, then your sample size decreases quite a bit. So um, this, is, this is where multiple imputation is quite a useful tool to use at least for the certain amount of that your uh, model estimate is essentially not biased when you removed all the uh, missing data. So this is where multiple imputation is um, somewhat indicated. So it's really sample size is a major limitation um, with the complete case approach. Multiple imputation is uh, quite a viable approach. Another uh, way of dealing with this is IP, uh, IPW, so the inverse probability weighting, where you basically you uh, give weight to those patients. In, in your model, you give weight to those patients that actually have uh, complete data. And you basically, you are, no, you give wrong. You give less weight to those with complete data and you basically give more weight uh, to those subpopulation from which you don't have sufficient data available. So you basically increase the weight on those where, where, uh, subpopulations where a lot of data is missing. And by that you basically, you, you strengthen the insight in that subpopulation and then the overall estimate, you essentially, you get these well represented in terms of weight. That's another way to do this. Um, was missing data. And yeah, so this is still running. I apologize for this delay on a Friday night. Um, this is incredible. This is loading since seven minutes now. Yeah, but this is uh, emphasizes already how much work actually goes into that computation level, right? And um, so it's really, it's a quite an advanced way of dealing with this data. 
So you still can't see my our studio, right? I mean, it flashes back and forth, but it's mainly dark. I can see it right now. Actually. Okay. Yes, because now I walked away. <laughs> okay, good. No, because essentially what you get here is the same printout than what I have shown you in the PDF. So I, I was hoping I could reproduce it now in R quickly on the few uh, on on the fly. Um, but that seems to be not really possible. But essentially what you would be seeing is this estimate. And this is uh, the result from your, uh, from your um, multiple imputations. So these, these are the estimates that are being produced by uh, multiple imputation based on the pooling of these 50 data sets where you have reproduced your model on those 50 data sets then pooled your models together and basically came up with this pooled overarching results with the multiple imputation imputed using the methods that we have chosen, which was um, uh, here the PMM, the predicted mean matching, the logistic regression, and the ordinal logistic regression. So basically, you get uh, here the pooled results, and here Professor Sang has basically shown the summary of uh, the multiple input, uh, the, 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 the native model, so to say, or the, the native model, the initial model that essentially did not use the multiple imputation. So, and this is what I meant was uh, the coefficients being kind of comparable. So if you compare each of these coefficients, I personally, if you would ask me, I would probably make uh, the primary analysis of such uh, an analysis um, basically uh, on the native model, on the initial model. Uh, and then in a sensitivity analysis, and sensitivity analysis are usually analyses where you test exactly these things, where you try to distinguish between a bias caused by the sample, uh, and you are certain that the model that you're using is consistent with what you see in the initial uh, in the initial model on the old, uh, overall data set. So essentially, uh, I would make this sensitivity analysis reported as such and would basically uh, use uh, this as a confirmatory analysis to the primary analysis in this overall model. That would be my approach if I were asked how I would approach it. So this in the meanwhile has, uh, has concluded and I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. Uh, so essentially, so we did now uh, this, we created data mice, and this is actually why I wanted to reproduce because I wanted you to see what you essentially see. So you can call all of these uh, aspects. So this is what is contained. These are the so called sub objects that I refer to as sub objects. So you basically you get here uh, a data option where the data option essentially. Uh, can be uh, addressed individually. And this is the raw data. Then you basically get to the imputed data. And uh, this is basically how you imputed the data. So we have not had any, um, any computation. So this was blank in the mice uh, command, if you remember. So there was no multiple imputation done for the first variable, which is here ID. Uh, consequently, this is kept here uh, at zero. Oh, yeah, at zero. So there's no uh, rows. Whereas you see here, those that were imputed. Uh, so these are the missing values essentially that were imputed for each of these uh, missing uh, values. So we have here log virus was 179. We have here 63. That's our damage. Then we have here 38, that's income. So you basically, you have here uh, those that were imputed and you can extract these if you wish to from uh, your uh, object that you have created. Then you have here M, that's information of how many imputations were done. Then you have here the blocks, the core. This is how it was called. This is basically our formula that was being used. And you have the different methods listed. So you get all of this information contained in this uh, mice 
object. So this uh, multiple imputation object. And here in that step, you're basically creating now uh, MI results. And this is basically where you pull all of this from up. Oops, not first. First, you use these data sets, this object, and you fit this in uh, a mice fit. And mice fit is now essentially um, a large mirror. So this is a, a mirror of, of all of these data sets. So this is on, on all those results, basically a data set. And here in that step, you basically, you pull it. And this is essentially what we're comparing down here. In this last step, we're basically comparing the MI results with our initial, and that again takes forever. Um, but you basically you get here in the last step, you get this comparison that I've shown here in the PDF from Professor Sang. So this is basically from the lecture slide. So this is this comparison between both these models. All right, so this is what I meant to show you. I just want to walk you through the labs and then give some additional explanation. And um, do you have any questions on any of this? If not, I believe we can conclude for today. Um, and we will hear again on Monday at seven if that works for everybody. And we can then uh, review some of the questions that may, uh, may be posted on the discussion board. Any questions you have with the research note or um, our related questions, um, whatever is useful. Okay, so then I will stop the recording and I will post the recordings from yesterday and the one from today.